Good morning. Good morning. Open your Bibles with me, if you would, to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Um, I'm actually going to be in this passage this week and next week. I'm going to preach the passage from different angles, so i um, talk about something completely different next week. Well, not completely different because it's in the Bible, you know, so, you know, but it's different next week, and it's going to be, um, it's going to kick off our new series. Next week, we start a brand new series that kind of is meant to follow this series. Let me uh, read the passage to you, 2 Timothy. I'll pick up in verse uh, 5, and I'll read through verse 12 and kind of talk you through a little bit, and then we'll jump into the outline. Uh, Timothy, uh, this is 2 Timothy, the, you know, there's obviously a 1 Timothy, and Timothy is a, a protege to Paul. He's being trained up in the ministry. Uh, this is Paul's last letter. Paul's getting ready to die. This is like the final thing Paul wrote. Uh, Paul's getting ready to, to die. And so he's writing kind of last instructions. Let me just remind you a few things. And that's what the mentor to the mentee, that's what's taking place here. In verse 5, um, I am reminded of your sincere faith. That word reminded, uh, we read that as in like, oh, I remembered something. But the actual word in the Greek means um, that I have received something to remind me. So something would have happened. A story came through, somebody, something happened. Uh, information came to Paul that reminded him of Timothy's sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. And I am persuaded also now lives in you. What we're going to talk about today is letting your story become a legacy. Um, the whole storyteller series can go on forever. Um, we need to tell stories all the time. We need to have stories being told every Sunday, every Monday, every Tuesday, every Wednesday, every Thursday, every Friday, every Saturday. Your story needs to be told. And remember, when we talk about your story, your story is made up of a lot of episodes, a lot of stories within your story. And sometimes your story begins with, yeah, I was an idiot. Like, okay, BJ made a wisecrack, you know, because he's BJ, about, you know, I was praying for my wife, and he was serious about that, and then he made the comment about, you know, Ashley must not have been praying because she stuck, I stuck with me, that whole thing. Do you know how he connected with her? <laughs> he's hanging out on the Carlinville Square, and he saw a black Mustang drive by with a pretty girl in it. He noticed the Mustang, not the girl. So her daddy buying her a Mustang is what started the whole problem. <laughs> now, that sounds funny, right? I met my wife. If you don't know the story, I'm not going to tell it. <laughs> if you keep coming, eventually I'll tell it. If you know the story, then I don't have to tell it, right? I accepted a double dog dare to stop someone, a group of people from calling people names, basically. I accepted a double dog dare <clears throat> to try out for cheerleading in college. If I hadn't done that, I would never have met Kathy. The water was cold this morning. Um, the reason was we had an electrical problem. We don't know what that problem was. Um, but here's the part you don't know. I forgot all about running baptistry water. So normally we'd have done that on Thursday or Friday or Saturday sometime. It doesn't take very long to heat it up, right? I came in early this morning, turned the baptistry water on, ran the baptistry water, turned the heater on, went to my office. What people came in and saw was some smoke. I just, 
I never forget the baptistry water. Never is probably too strong of a term. Do you know when I, okay, so last night I put my baptism clothes in a bag, like I had a bag, right? I prepared to come. So I, it's not I forgot. I knew I was baptizing this morning. I knew Cameron was gone. I knew I'm baptizing. I, I knew all that was happening. I'm laying in bed this morning, you know that place where you're getting, you know the alarm's getting ready to go off, you're getting ready to get up. And all of a sudden I remembered, hey, I didn't run baptistry water. And I thought, I wonder if Cameron ran baptistry water. I bet Cameron didn't run baptistry water. Hmm, I better get, get, over, get over there and get that baptistry water ran so it can heat up. Now, I was frustrated. But what if I had ran baptistry water Thursday? Or Friday. Or let's just say yesterday at, you know, 3 o'clock in the afternoon I came in, lit it up, walked out the door. Would we have had a fire overnight? I don't know. The point I'm trying to make is we really have no idea all the things that God does in our life to provide for us and protect us. We really have no idea what God's going to do in our lives to provide and protect for our children or our grandchildren or our great-grandchildren. We never really think about how our story or those things that are stories that make up our story will be used by God to create, for the day's topic, a legacy. Timothy's grandma and mom were uh, Jewish believers. They were Jewish people who had chosen to believe that Jesus was the Messiah as opposed to that group that chose to believe that he was the Messiah. Timothy's father was a Greek man, and there's no evidence he is a believer. There's zero evidence he is a believer. So maybe he wasn't. What Paul says is, I saw this first in your grandmother. And the grandmother passed it on. And I saw this second in your mom. And now I see this sincere faith in you. Think about all the things we pass on. We may not use the word legacy to talk about it. But, you know, we pass on things, things we teach our children, things our grandparents taught us, ways of thinking, ways of behaving. Things we value. For the day we're talking about letting your story become a legacy. And really the thing that matters is our spiritual life. It's great if your grandpa taught your dad how to throw a curveball and your dad taught you how to throw a curveball and you taught your son how to throw a curveball. That's great. But that doesn't get us in heaven. It's wonderful if, you're, if your you know, child has taken on your love for something, right? Or is born with your you know, skill in a certain area or your you know, uh, giftedness in a certain area, right? That's awesome. But there's one thing that really matters in this entire world. And it's Jesus in our relationship with him. That's it. That's it. The day die, comes we die. The day comes that our children die, our grandchildren die. Everyone is going to die. And the thing that matters is what do we teach them about Jesus? I want my kids to love what I love. I want them to love their mom, right? If, I, if they love all the things I love and they don't really fall in love with Jesus, what good is that? It first lived in your grandmother Lois and then your mother Eunice, and now I'm persuaded also lives in you. Verse 6, for this reason, and which because I see this in you, I remind you 
He's referring back to something that happened in 1 Timothy. Okay, so there's 1 and 2 Timothy. He's referring back to that in chapter 4, verse 14. And I'll, I'll mention it here in a second again. I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Now, that is not at all what that means. If you go back and read chapter 4, verse uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14, it's that it happened through, as, as we were praying for you, laying on hands, they were praying for him, right? So Timothy's here, and they would gathered around him, and they were praying for him, okay? And so they put, placed their hands on him as they prayed for him, and it says, through the word of prophecy, in the words, Paul would have received what the Bible would refer to as a word of knowledge, I know what your spiritual gift is, and said that to him. That's what that's talking about. God is the one who gives gifts, and, and Paul will talk about that here in a second, but God's the one who gives gifts. The, the, the gift that's listed here, flame into, uh, uh, fan into flame, the gift, that word gift is the word charismaton. We talk about that a lot around here because it's a motivational gift. So this is in, uh, in Romans chapter 12. And uh, that's the one of seven that you have one of. You're born with one of these seven gifts. What Paul's saying to him is, if you see, it's also singular. It's not plural, right? The gift. Every time it's mentioned, talking about the individual's gift, there's one. You have one motivational gift. Now, what happened in this case was Paul just had a, the Holy Spirit reveal to Paul what Timothy's gift was, and he said, this is your gift. The word of prophecy came to him. I mean, a word of knowledge came to him, and then he spoke what that was to Timothy. That happens today, but we actually have a test you can take, right? I didn't put it in the bulletin like I do a lot of times, but you can contact me, and I'll give you the, I think maybe it's on, the, on our website, even. I'm not sure about that, but it, there's a test you can take, and I'll tell you what you're what your motivational gift is, what your charismaton gift is, what you're talking about right here. When it says fan it into flame, it'll tell you what it is. And it'll, it'll give you your list of strengths and weaknesses, you know, your drawbacks and how God wants to use it. That's what he's talking about right here. The seven are, uh, see if I can remember those. We got um, uh, leadership, exhortation, giving, um, mercy, prophecy, teaching, did I say giving already? Serving. Those are your seven. Everyone has one of those. Timothy had one of those. How do you know? Well, it's singular right here. It's singular every time the Bible talks about it. Related to a person's individual gift. It says, fan in the flame, the charismaton gift. One of those seven. So whatever his was, right? Fan it into flame. Which is in you through the laying on my hands. Which is, you know, not really, Paul didn't give it to him. For this spirit, for, for the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join me in suffering for the gospel. I'll come back to that in a second. Number one in the outline, we are so busy chasing and surviving that we rarely spend time thinking about our legacy. We're so busy chasing and surviving to try and get through another week. Crazy how it just keeps rolling through, doesn't it? Can you believe it's almost 2020? That's crazy. If you're like me, you grew up in grade school, and we thought by 2000 we'd be the Jetsons riding around in a little, you know, <laughs> pushing buttons and food showed up and saying it's crazy. 2020, like, man, we'll never get there. Another year passes. We look at our kids and think, man, how did they get so old so fast? You think that when your kid turns eight. You think when your kid turns 18. Some of us have thought that when our kids turn 30. You know what I'm saying? Like, wow. How in the world did time fly by so fast. See, we've wasted a lot of time. We've been distracted. We've chased so many things. Not necessarily bad things. The real question is, is the priorities right? Are we passing on a legacy of sincere faith? Like what we're talking about in this passage, that I saw sincere faith in your grandmother, and I've seen sincere faith in your mom, and now I see sincere faith in you. Or are we passing on a, a, a sincere faith? 
a life-changing faith. Not saying, hey, you know, you go to church because we go to church. Not getting your kids to obey you because they're afraid of you. We're afraid of the punishment that comes. Have we taught our kids to fall in love with Jesus? Have we lived a life that gave them evidence to make their own choices? My whole life, I've, I've heard people quote uh, the proverb that says, uh, raise up a child in the way he should go, and when he's not old, he won't depart from it. And they always apply that to the wayward teenager or, you know, adult who was far from God, wasn't paying attention to God. Well, you raised in church. Okay, because I'm not trying to beat anybody up about this. Okay, so if this applies to you, I'm not talking to you. I'm just talking. What that means is, the actual Hebrew wording means when you raise up a child according to his natural bent. How God wired them to be. That your six month old has a charismaton gift, a personality. A list of things they naturally like. I, like my first word was ball. If my parents would have said, you're never allowed to play sports. Okay. I, would, I came out of the womb hardwired a certain way by God. And Paul's getting ready to say that in a second. So did you. And what it says is, is help the kid figure out who he's called to be. Help them figure out how God wired them. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, that you are the workmanship of God created in Christ Jesus. And he has a list of things he wants to accomplish in your life. And the Bible actually says he prepared that in advance. And you go read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. So that baby born, Tim, born, was hardwired by God with a charismaton gift, mind's exhortation, with a certain whatever you want to call it. And the job of my parents was to raise me according to my natural bent, the way God created me, and to trust God to work in me and through me, to provide and protect, and me to make choices to choose him. We get so busy sometimes trying to change our kids. I'm not talking about their misbehaving, they need discipline. I'm not talking about that, right? That's real. That doesn't mean you're not raising them toward their bent. It just means that you're helping them mature and develop. You're giving them no consequences and make choices, right? Not letting your kids have any consequences is always a problem. But sometimes we get so busy around wrong priorities that our kid can be a great business person or they'd be really good and get great math grades got a lot of scholarships went to college because they really were a good student they're a great athlete and they, they make us really proud because they do a lot of cool things on courts or fields that's all wonderful but the question is where do they stand with Jesus is their faith in Christ, not your faith in Christ for them, is their faith in Christ enough to stand the test that's coming? If we live our lives in a way that honors Christ in front of our family, that kid and God will work out the other details. God's job is to draw them their job is to place their faith in Jesus. He gives them grace. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, right? They were saved by grace through faith. God will give them grace. But they've got to choose to place their faith in him. If they don't place their faith in him, they can go to church. You can say they got baptized. That doesn't save them.
the best way for your grandkids to know Jesus is to raise kids who fall in love with Jesus. Number two, fan into flame what God has entrusted to you. Fan into flame what God has trusted to you. So my gift gets exhortation. It comes with a list of uh, drawbacks and a list of the way God uses it supernaturally, and there's things that I, it's just who I am. Fan into flames. Like the, the word picture is exactly what you think it is. It's, it's a picture of a fire that's smoldering. It just needs a little air. You know, you can bend over and blow into it. You can take something and wave at it. If you really want to, fire up the leaf blower. That works too. Shh. Turns into furnace pretty fast. That's the word picture. The fire that's smoldering that has really no value to itself. But you get some air to it, all of a sudden it begins to flame up again. And now it's worth something. Now it has use because there's a flame. Is your faith really kind of smoldering? I mean, just process for a second. Is your faith kind of smoldering? You're not near as hot as you once were in your spiritual walk with Christ? That you've let some distractions come in? You've let some, some um, uh, wrong priorities come in? That you got so busy trying to survive or trying just to get through the life that, that you had in front of you or hit the to-do list that your boss gave you or that you gave yourself and do all of the things you're trying to do and keep up with the schedule and got your kids, you know, all, all these things we got going on and we're just so busy, so busy, so busy, so busy, so busy. But our spiritual flame is pretty smoldering. We know what God called us to do and be. And we're not there. My guess is that applies to a lot of people. That God wants to reignite the flame in you. But it doesn't say let God reignite the flame in you. It doesn't say let God flame, you know, reflame that in you. It, it says that you are to fan into flame. I'll talk about more about how that happens a little bit next week about the things, you know, some of the applications of that. But if you're smoldering, if your faith is wavered, if you just go back and look, I, I stopped going to church. I started going to church and just sitting. There was this place where God was stirring me to take a next step, and I chose not to. I'm just telling you, God's going to bring you back to that place. And there's no going beyond it. That's how God operates, right? God's going to bring you back to that next place. You say no to him, that what you're experiencing is grieving and quenching the Holy Spirit. There's lots of people who, follow, who are followers of Christ. There are pastors of churches, there are church leaders, there are entire churches that go through the motions of doing church and even have what we call good church because they sang good songs and preached good biblical messages and had nice prayers and raised money and gave offerings and stuff, and it was awesome and it was great, and they, they did the programs and the whatever, but they're absent of the presence of the Spirit of God. Like, oh, no, no, we're not absent of the presence of the Spirit of God. Well, then show me exactly what God is doing in you. The only way you know you're saved is the activity of the Spirit of God in your life, right? That's how you know. Well, the same thing's true for a church. Like, where's the brokenness? Where's the humility? Where's the willingness to say yes to God regardless of what the cost is to us personally? Think about all the areas where we say no. If God just stirred you to come to an altar... Oh, no, I don't want to do that. If God has stirred you to be more demonstrative in your worship, well, I don't, I, that's kind of weird. I mean, I like to watch other people be demonstrative in their worship, but I don't want to be demonstrative in mine. Why not? Like, what's the hang-up? What's the difference? Like, if I like to watch someone else be demonstrative in their, like, if, if this far section was really demonstrative in their worship, right? Which don't make it any more sincere. Don't misunderstand me, right? But they're, if they're demonstrative and this section loves watching that, but they're like, oh, I don't want to do that because that'll make me feel weird. Okay, but don't you think that this section would love to watch you guys worship? And that that section, or that this section would love to watch this section worship? I mean, just think about that for a second. Little things that we say no to God in. What God's want to do is, is stir us to say yes. I'll come back to that in just a little bit. Number four, or excuse me, number three, 
Apathy, insecurity, and fear do not come from God. God did not give you a spirit of fear or insecurity or apathy, but a spirit of power, of love, of self-discipline. So you think about all the things that we say no because of. We're too busy. That didn't come from God. I'm not saying everybody can do everything. But there are times God stirs you to say yes. There are times that you're not stepping into the role that God has you to step into. Now, let's go back all the way back to the fall, right? That you're supposed to be here. That you belong here. That God created you. That he chose a time you're supposed to live in a location you're supposed to live in. Acts chapter 17, verse 24 and 25. He drew you to a place that you call home. To a place that feels like family to you. Was that by accident? Was that to sit in a chair and do nothing? Well, let me read here for a second. So verse 7 is where it says that, right? Verse 8. So do not be ashamed to testify or of the testimony of the Lord or me as his prisoner. Rather, join me in the suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Verse 9, and this is the why. He has saved us. And called us. In my Bible, the word and is circled. He didn't just save you. He didn't just draw you to himself to save you. He saved you and called you. That Romans chapter 11, verse 29. That the gifts and calling of God. The word gifts is the word chrismaton again, right? The gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. It means you're going to give an account for the things that God has entrusted to you. For the hard wiring he's placed in your life. For the list of accomplishments, the things that he wanted to do in you, through you, for you. He has saved us and called us to a holy life. The word holy isn't perfect. It means set apart. It means he's the highest priority. I'm still going to be of this. I'm still going to do that. I'm still going to raise these kind of kids. I'm still going to live in this kind of place. This is my life. But I'm called to be set apart. I'm not called to attend church. I'm not called to have a good reputation. I'm called to live a life that is set apart. Not because of anything we have done. Not say because of works, but grace. Not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. I mean, just wrap your head around that for a second. God's the one with the purpose. He called you for his purpose. The funk you're caught up in is not his plan for you. The smoldering fire that you're allowing to happen is not what God's plan for you is. God called you and he purposed you and he hardwired you before you were ever born with a list of things he wanted to accomplish in your life. That the way he evidences and proves himself to you is not by listening to a preacher convince you, but let his spirit of God draw you. As you start taking your own steps toward him, he will prove himself to you. This grace, and the word grace in both of those is the same, it's a different, it's the same beginning word. You're saved by this word, and that gift that God gives you is a gift he gives you because of his grace. It's a grace gift. It's the same word that we're talking about. This grace that God has given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Again, that's Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Before time, before the beginning of time. Not when you were born, not when you were conceived. That's not when God gave you that. But it is now being revealed through the appearing of his son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has destroyed death. He didn't destroy death as in death doesn't exist anymore because everybody dies, right? Death happens. The word destroyed is actually the word rendered inoperative. That death doesn't accomplish what it meant to accomplish. That when the follower of Christ dies, they just continue to live in a place called heaven as opposed to they die and go to separate from God in a place called hell. And this brought to life the immortality and the light through the gospel. It is this gospel that I appointed to herald this good news of Jesus. I've been appointed to speak to herald and the apostle as a teacher. This is why I am suffering. So he's inviting us to do this because this is what I do. 
It says, yet it, there is no cause for shame because I know whom I have believed and what I have entrusted to him to keep until that day. And just what he's really saying to Timothy is, listen, I am convinced. I need you to be convinced. If you're not convinced, then you won't do what I've done. You won't follow Christ the way I follow Christ if you're not convinced. If, if, the, if Timothy's mother wasn't convinced, Timothy's grandmother's faith wasn't good enough for Timothy's mother. If Timothy's mother was convinced on her own, not because grandma said so, because she took her own next steps and God evidenced himself and proved himself to her. And then it was Timothy's turn. That Timothy had to take his own next steps. And as he took his own next steps, God proves himself to him. What Paul's saying is, this is the process. You have to fan this into flame so God can prove himself to you. This is how it happens. From the very beginning in the Old Testament, uh, at the Garden of Eden, what was the big argument about? God said, don't eat from this one tree. The tree of knowledge. Nothing wrong with education. But here's the problem. God hardwires you for a personal relationship with him. God did not hardwire you to know a lot of information about him. He hardwired you to know him. There's a thing in you that's searching to know. Are you really there? Do you really exist? Are you really true? Does this stuff really work? There's a place in all of us that only God can fill. And we can put all the other things in that place and make it seem like it's okay. But eventually they lose their luster and we realize they didn't meet the need that we had. They didn't accomplish what we needed to accomplish. The problem with just having Bible knowledge, I'm raised in church. I learned how to do sword drills or sing the Bible books of the Bible song. I know what the books of the Bible and what order they go in. Or, I mean, all the things that people can talk about, right? I've... I've read Revelation 900 times. I know how the end times are supposed to happen, or I don't know, whatever somebody wants to talk about. I can quote this whole book by itself, and it, it, I don't care how many books you've read. I don't, I don't care how many times you've read through the Bible. None of that saves you. None of that saves you. It, it doesn't save your children. It doesn't save your grandkids. It doesn't save your parents, your friends and family. What if the legacy we chose to live, instead of one of, I can't make a difference, no one's going to listen to me. What if the legacy we chose to live was one of a spirit of God who indwelt us. We recognize that the very power that raised Christ from the dead indwelt us. He lived in us. That the one that God used to speak everything into existence lives in you. What if we just choose to start a legacy of saying yes to Jesus and letting people around us see our stories, hear our stories. Do you think people will start choosing Jesus for themselves? The early church didn't win converts because of information. They won converts because of a demonstration of the power 
of the living God. The Savior who raised from the dead. Miracles. The authority of God. Words of knowledge and wisdom. Acts of faith being lived out. People of sincere faith who chose to follow, who chose to follow Jesus. Number four in the outline. God has given us what we need to step into his purpose for us. Now listen, I don't know what God's called you to do. Maybe I have an opinion. And maybe God would actually speak to me and I could tell you what that is, but that's not the point of how I'm wrapping this up. But what I know is, is that God knows. Right, so it's just, God knows how he wired you to be. God knows the list of things he prepared in advance. I mean, let's go back to my wisecracks over on. Do you think that God orchestrated a pretty girl driving by in a Mustang on the Carnival Town Square? Or is that coincidence? Do you think that Tim being hardwired to step up against bullies and accept that a double dog dare to, instead of a fight. Was that coincidence? First time I met Kathy, a dude I barely knew, picked up a girl I'd never met before and threw her at me so I had to catch her because he wanted to show her how strong I was. Before I knew her name, she was in my arms. It's pretty funny, isn't it? I mean, is it coincidence that I forgot all about the battery being reheated until this morning? I don't know. I can't convince you if you don't believe, but let me just tell you something. I am convinced. And that's why I believe. If you're not convinced, it's on you. Because God wants to evidence himself to you. God wants to prove himself to you. He doesn't have to prove himself. He wants to. He wants to show you. Not not show you because of what someone else can see. He wants to show you because he loves you. You say, I've been saved for a long time. I've been following God for a long time. I know, that's not the problem. God wants to show you what he wants to do in and through you. He didn't just save you. He called you to live a life that belonged to him, a life that was set apart. That if you fall on your face, just get back up and keep coming. That his grace is enough. That his mercy never runs out. That his love for you and his faithfulness toward you is renewed every single day. If, that, if you can't say that, then step into him. Give him a chance to prove himself to you. Yes, he will ask you things that will stretch you. Dude, he's God. That's what he does. He, he will ask you things that cause you to change. But if there's not something in you that wants to do that, do you even know if you're saved or not? See, if the Spirit of God indwells you, He's going to want to call you and draw you into the work of God. If there's nothing in you stirred to take a next step, I'd be terrified if I was you. I'd be like, what in the world is going on? I went through a five-year window where I felt nothing. But it was because of my sin and my rebellion. I just didn't want to follow Christ. I, I, I wanted to be saved, but I did not want to surrender to the ministry. That was my whole deal. It wasn't I didn't believe in God, and I didn't love God. I just wasn't going to say yes because of a hundred reasons. And I was stubborn. But I was patient. All the things that I needed God to prove to me before I'd be willing to say yes to Him as related to my ministry, 
God was going to show me along the way. He wasn't going to give me knowledge before it happened. But as I said yes and took the next step, he's going to prove himself to me. And as I said yes, took the next step, he was going to prove himself to me. And I'd say yes, take a next step. I saw God over time, over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, prove himself to me. That's why I'm convinced my faith does not save my children. My faith won't save my grandkids. But man, I can choose to live a legacy that I leave behind for people to follow. So can you. You don't have to be called in the full-time ministry. We're all, if you know Christ, you're already in full-time ministry. You're called not just to be saved. You're called according to his purpose, his plan, his hardwiring for you before you were ever born. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I... Uh, I got stories. I got funny stories. I got stories of brokenness and pain. I got stories of victory and triumph. I got just private stories. God, all of us have stories like those. God, I pray we begin to see our lives in light of you and your plan. We're called to be followers of you, not to do our own thing and hope that you're okay with that. We're called to serve you. We're called to, to be your witnesses. And God, for those in this room, those at our campuses, those who are listening in three weeks from now online someplace, God, I pray that your spirit intersects us right now. Clarify the next step we're supposed to take towards the step for salvation or the step of repentance a step of changing our mind so we can change our direction and purpose. God, make it clear. Break us. God, use us. Since you just now pray. Amen.